he vanishes. <laughs> that would be about normal for this show, you know. It just it would I'm be. honestly surprised with all the cats that you have that are not like hanging out and doing you know Olympics gymnastics on the on the back of your courts. Back it has court. happened. I, I can't say that it hasn't happened because it has happened. <laughs> It just seems like that's that's the kind of thing that would happen at your Of course, house. that's not nearly the, the biggest crisis that I've had with cats over my desk recently. Right now, um, just a couple of days ago, I had to take down one of the steps behind my on, on the wall behind my monitor because Leo decided he was going to use it as a launching pad to get higher, and he jumped on it and just pressed down with those back legs to launch off, and the whole thing just uh, did like this and then came back up, and I'm like... That looks like it might be loose. I think I should probably take that off the wall and make sure it hasn't come loose. <laughs> hmm. The effects of chunk. The effects of chunk. <laughs> See, right now, I've got one roundish one up there and one squarish one. The squarish one is the one that had the problem. I've got another round one. I think I may end up taking that squarish one off and replacing it with a round because he's a chunk. And he likes that bed, as as you can tell. Uh, he likes the bed. Clearly. Well, it could be worse. It could be much worse. It could be a much larger chunk. It could be two chunks. So is this this is is this the is this a religious holiday this weekend? I can't remember if that's this yeah. weekend or next weekend. That yeah. explains yeah. why we've got three people watching. <laughs> I don't think that's the reason. I mean, I know some people were some people. Some schools wind up um, structuring their spring break around Good Easter. Friday. So yeah, yeah and, and oh, Easter is, is this spring break for some folks. So for, well, for my kids, this past week was spring break. Yeah. Um, but I know other places they got Friday off, and then their spring break is the first week of April. So they have the Easter weekend going into spring break. It's different for everybody. All right. Pretty much. Well, that said, we should probably say howdy, folks, and welcome to another episode of the Dev Robot Society. I am Paul E. Cooley. Joining me as always, sometimes, always, sometimes, Veronica Jaguar. <laughs> and again, always, sometimes, Mr. Terry Mixon. <laughs> you know... Thank you, Morthus. And you're welcome. So, so how did the tournament come out last week? Um, so last week's tournament came out really well. Um, the place we stayed, it took me took my back two days to recover from the non-existent padding on the mattress. Because dear God, that was a slab of sleeping space. Um, but my daughter wound up getting third overall in her event. Um, and the way that the tournaments work is they have several weekends because there are almost 2,100 kids who enter in the tournament across all of the different age groups. And her age group isn't one of the biggest, um, but that's when the female bowlers often get more competitive and it's likely that I think there are two more, there are two more weekends um, this weekend, obviously because of the Easter, Easter Sunday, but the two weekends after they'll have more squads. So she'll likely still move down, but her sitting in third is pretty good. So she'll likely get scholarship money out of it. One's all said and done. And that can be anywhere from 50 to $200. Hmm. So, and that all goes into a fund that she can touch when she's 18. So ah. yeah, it was, it was decent. She had, she had some, some good stuff going. Nice. Her last game was terrible and she just laughed it off. And she's currently at a tournament right now with her brother and her dad. And um, it is not going as well as last weekend did so oh well that's not good so paul how did you boil the bunny 
How did I boil the bunny? Well, I actually used an instant pot and it made things so much faster because, you know, you just really, there's really very little you have to do besides skin it, eviscerate it, and just throw it in the pot. I boiled the bunny, but I did not boil the Easter eggs. <laughs> I'm oh, really disturbed by this. Terry, see earlier like, conversations before the show about certain conditions, because wow. Like, <laughs> um. <laughs> mm. I got nothing on that. Terry, what the hell has been going on with you? I've been wrestling with ACX because, curse it, they've been giving me problems all my, week. My wrestling, jello wrestling, arm wrestling. Knowing that this is ACX, I'm it's not sure wrestling. that any of those kinds of wrestling would really appeal to me because it's, serpent wrestling. it's like, you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, it's, it's a matter of, it's been 10 years since I set up all of my accounts for publishing and audio and whatnot. And back when I set up my ACX account, I somehow used my personal email address rather than the publishing email address. And it hasn't been an issue until now, and now it's an issue. So now we're fighting to get that fixed. That's it. Nothing like getting in a threatening email in the middle of the week going, you're broken, you're not using your right email, and we're going to go ahead and keister your account if you don't fix it in seven days. Keister your account, wow. <laughs> That's a technical term. Apparently. <laughs> Sounds like it goes along with, you know, punch cards and microfiche and you know mimeograph so in order to transfer all your shit to the to to a single id are they going to have to like put you in some kind of manner transporter beam i mean after all we have no idea how these two systems were not integrated well let me tell you what what i have been told by their their help people <laughs> they said that to get it transferred I would have to create a new account using the appropriate login, and then they would migrate everything across. Now, whether or not that's what actually happens, because I wasn't going to start that process until the people that actually emailed me said that's what we're going to do, because as soon as I start doing something, I'm going to blow up whatever they're doing in the middle, and then I'm going to be hosed. You have the most interesting technical problems. They make they, they put mine to shame quite often when you have them. They're just very interesting. Well, as, as part of doing that, I went ahead and looked at my Author Central page, and it was using my personal email address as well. But it was a simple matter of sending them an email going, hey, I'm using this email, but I should have been using this other one. Can you fix that? And they sent me an email back to later in the day. Done. Yeah, you ever get the feeling that the various different parts of Amazon don't actually communicate with one another? You can't actually just go to one place and have a fix for everybody. You got to go to four di 14 different departments. And it's true. I don't see. I didn't have any problem with my Author Central page, but I knew as soon as I just let it sit, there was going to be a problem at some point. Maybe you just need to go back to the ACX folks and see the Author Central people have a very you know clean and direct process. Why can't you be like Author Central? I believe because it's because ACX and Audible stink even worse than Amazon does. How about that? No, they're all the same goddamn company, and they have two systems. They somehow integrated. I don't know. Audible more. robs us a lot more than Amazon does. Yes, forty percent. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that only happened after Amazon bought Audible or bought ACX. But they're obviously, you know, these. It's always been. No, it was fifty percent in the beginning. Well, it's, it's, I know it was fifty percent in the beginning because I still have a few comp. No, I don't. Well, I don't have any contracts that sell consistently at the fifty percent mark anymore because people either bought me out or they just they just don't sell. So, regardless, here's so here's to hoping that whatever uh, deal Brian uh, Brandon Sanderson worked out with Audible, you know. Bumps it back up to 50. Wouldn't that be nice? Believe it when I see it. When it should be 70. Agreed. We, we'll be uh, lucky if we get 50. Are you here to destroy more cat furniture, boy? Come here and tell everybody. Oh, God. His chonkiness left, the, left his, his bed. Oh, no, he didn't. He found his bed. <laughs>
Well, I have been dealing with a lot of crazy, crazy stuff that hopefully most people don't have to deal with. But it seems like when you get to my age, it starts to happen. So uh, no emergencies yet, but we thought we had a couple emergencies. But those things have been assuaged for the time being. Other than that, I'm still kind of drifting between books, trying to figure out what I want to do with my life. What do I want to be when I grow up? Well, you know, that's why we're here this week, to go ahead and brainstorm with you a completely new work that will change your life forever. We are not going to do that. <laughs> Wait, but we were already talking about the possum shifter romance. How can you go ahead we and put were. the kibosh I on mean, that? I, I'm, I'm like seriously looking forward to this. Look, okay, since you guys are trying to start us down a genre bunny trail, we might as well go ahead and talk about this since it's in the title. All right. Let's look at what Paul does. Paul writes stories with monsters or uh, other effects, phenomena or whatever that usually chase down people and kill them. Therefore, there's a lot of people running for their lives while they're trying to solve mysteries and figure out what's trying to kill them or why it's trying to kill them. That's so more like or less Scooby-Doo but with a body count. Scooby-Doo with a does body count. Does the black count. water Scooby snack? Two Scooby snacks? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So when you distill down Paul's thing of what Paul does, that's to put it in the simplest of fucking terms. Those are the stories that I usually write. I don't now, see how a possum shifter romance can't fit into that theme. <laughs> because I also have a penchant for tragic endings. And you I've been told have tragic endings. You don't have to have, have, you don't have, to have a happy, happily ever after. Okay, talk to the asshole sitting below me because that's not what he says about romance. If it's going to be a romance, it's, it's kind of got to have to have the happy for now happy or happy. For now. Yeah. You can have a happy for now. Doesn't have to be a happily ever after. He would end up eating the bunny shifter, so, or the possum shifter, so there you are. <laughs> he actually ends up no, as real kill. No, I, I, I've, I've, I've got this for you. I totally have this for you. You, just, you set it in the bayou. And you have like some big bad Aloha or some like bog monster that has to be defeated. But the defeat only happens long enough because the possum shifter's love interest is mortal. And not not so much as the, the shift, not that the shifter's immortal, but they're far longer lived. And then when, you know, he puts his lover to rest, then he has to go back and finally commit himself it's, to it's possum revenge time oh not possum revenge it's possum kebab time because the bog monster is hungry but the bog monster see it's just a different it, jumping across genres like that that would be a major shift for me major it shift. would be i tried to it write would. a romance that's called lovers and i was taken to 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 town for the way it ended because it has a tragic ending and I was taken to town by that because I ruined a perfectly good romance. <laughs> but that's about as close as I get to that. Antoine says, ah, who possesses Scooby-Doo, first Garaga or the Black? Mm. Oh, Garaga. If you mm. want a better story, like it's Garaga. Garaga. Yeah. Scooby-Doo and Garaga land. Scooby's actually a Nephilim. Holy shit, that would be so crazy. No, Velma's a <laughs> Nephilim. Do what now? Oh, Thelma? Velma's the Nephilim. Velma. Is it Thelma or Velma? Velma. 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 With a B. Was a B. Wow, I had a moment. Anyway, that would be a so problem. So what's Daphne for... doing then? I mean, really, I'm not sure how that works out. She's just another succubus. Could be. Oh, no, there's no question. <laughs> as much as Paul wanted to, adjust, to avoid this, we are now talking about Paul's next novel. We are not. Martha says my first six books that I'm releasing over 2024 and first half of 2025 are all in different genres. Good for you. That's going to be a challenge. It's building an audience with doing multiple genres is not impossible, but it definitely adds complications to the process. So I, I wish you luck with that. It takes a lot of you can't cross promote as much because your readers for one genre may not translate over to your readers for another genre. I write so, science fiction. I wrote a post-apocalyptic novel that I have been told by other people that have read it that is one of the best ones that they've read. 
yet it sold so badly that I could not justify doing a second book in the series. The audience just did not come over. And I write suspense, and it doesn't matter if it's sci-fi, garaga, fantasy, whatever you want to call it, it's always suspense. That's my bread and butter is writing suspense stories. And that does not necessarily mean those folks are going to follow me over to another genre that, that is not suspenseful. So yeah. that changes, it, it kind of determines some of the stories that you want to write and that you feel like you can write, especially if you're actually living on your, on your writerly income. A busted book is a busted book and that's bad because you spend a lot of time and money on it. And if it doesn't sell, you're fucked. You know, you missed an opportunity, you chose wrong, or you wrote a poor, you, you wrote a bad book and you have, you're stuck with it. And that's a source of income that you were counting on that is not there now. But, but that is not okay. to say that you should not try if that is what you want to do. That is absolutely mm -hmm. true. If you can justify to yourself that it might not be as successful as what el whatever else you've got going on, it can be a project of love. There is absolutely nothing wrong with a creator doing a project for love without the expectation that it's going to be financially successful. That would be derelict saga. <laughs> It just became my art project. Antoine says, Paul writes shit so weird, you know it's all in the same universe, and even if he thinks it isn't. <laughs> See, making it suspenseful, the husband will find the trophy wife and the gardener. She's... What? <laughs> I think that meant gardener's shed. Gardener's shed. Okay. <laughs> My brain tried to process that. That went. <laughs> <"Just> gonna, <laughs> uh, all right, you were right. Morto Smith shed. Oh. But there are things I do want to write that aren't necessarily suspenseful. I tried to write an event, a sci-fi adventure book. It's sold okay, but it's got suspense in it as well because it's just. That's an you know, element. It's do. not a genre. It is true. Mm -hmm. It is true. But it's marketed as a sci-fi adventure first. And because I wanted to try and, and broaden things out a little bit, whether or not people are what, what people are going to consider it when they finish the book, I, I have no idea. But I'm glad <laughs> I wrote it. And I had fun writing it and it will pop, it will pay itself off. When I wrote the post-apocalyptic novel, it took me 23 days to write it. I just could not leave the keyboard. I was having so much fun writing something that was so radically different than everything that I had done before. And I don't regret having done it. It was a lot of fun to do. I still want to write my Garaga Western. And it was from a single point of view. That was fun too. Oh yeah, especially after doing as many uh, uh, ensemble casts, a single point of view is just so refreshing. Mm -hmm. It really does. I talked about doing the next series as, as first person for the protagonist and third person if anybody else has a point of view. I'm really starting to lean towards not allowing anyone else to have a point of view and just keeping it one protagonist. One there's point no of view, reason, no matter what. There's no reason not to. Mm -hmm. And then it's almost easier to lay, it's almost easier to mislead your reader and, you know, have more surprises there later on if you've mm -hmm. got that one point of view. So... I look flummoxed because I'm trying to see how many words, how many more words you're going to have to have for that character or more events of anything if you're cutting off other points of view. How do you, um, how do you mean? I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Well, technically, if I take, if I take a book like uh, AAT, it's got very, very low number of points of view. It's going to be a shorter book than something like Derelict Saga, where I have seven or eight different points of view. Just yeah. because there's a lot more scenery to be chewed up by a group of people than there is of one person. Mm -hmm. The reason that it might work for this better is because the character that I'm looking at doing business with, you can think of him like James Bond or Ethan Hunt out of the Mission Impossible stuff. He's mm -hmm. the centerpiece. Events right. are happening around him and it's his pursuit of whatever he's pursuing that's, that's important. Whatever's happening off screen, 
that can be a bus coming in from the side to blindside him at any moment, but you don't have to necessarily show the driver getting into the bus. No, and I wasn't saying you do, and I wasn't saying you shouldn't do it in first, in, you know, first person. I'm just thinking in my head immediately, okay, that cuts down the number of words I have. Yeah. Or when, cuts down, it, it will make for a shorter book. When I was writing in the uh, post-apocalyptic world, it had more intimate events. It's, it's not necessarily that the plot had less to go with because I'm a discovery writer. I'm going to write until my brain says, you, you're getting along in the tooth. You've got to bring this book to a close. Right. So it's not going to be that I have to stretch it out and add more things. It's I'm going to add more things in the middle to make things more complicated and add maybe a, a crisis or two to deal with. But it'll all be natural because I'll be making it up as I go along, just like I do everything else. Yeah, see, I think that's why you're going to be successful at it. This will be new, but really it's just putting all the skills you've already had, just putting it forward into one new thing. New so boss, same as the old boss? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but you've got, like Paul said, you've, you've written enough up to this point that just changing one or two things to begin a new project isn't it's not that big of a challenge. The biggest it's not challenge, that big of a jump. Yeah, the biggest challenge out of this is going to be writing first person. It's been a very long time since I've written first person. Do you read third person? I'm sorry, do you read first person? I read first person. I read third person. It. I don't have a problem with either one. When I was writing under a, a pseudonym to get my original practice, that was all first person. So it's not like I'm afraid of writing first person. Mm -hmm. It's just been almost 10 years since I've written anything significant in first person. So we'll see how many times I backslide and start doing things like phrasing it wrong and, and getting it third person rather than first person. Yeah. Martha I says, think... oh, oh, go no, ahead. Go ahead. Go for it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to run over you. Hmm. So uh, Martha, Martha says, all of my works share the same cosmos and have all taken place on the same earth. And there are possible crossovers and trying to find out if those crossovers will be off-putting for readers. Nope. If you're in the same it. universe and you market it as, as that same universe, I don't think it's going to matter all that much. Probably no, not. That'll, that can actually be a draw for readers. I mean, I yeah. remember when I was younger, one of my favorite authors um, was, is uh, Madeline Lengel from, you know, A Wrinkle in Time. Well, A Wrinkle in Time is the beginning of one of her series. And then she's got another one that's, um, uh, I'll have to look it up. Meet the, I forget what the name of the family is, but essentially she's got two, she has two lines. Think of it as like a helix. She's got two lines and the Murrays, the family that's featured in A Wrinkle in Time, those books all involve time travel. And then the other ones do not involve time travel. However, there are characters who cross over. And so you will wind up reading some books. Meet the Austins, that's what it is. Um, so you wind up seeing some characters who show up in, you know, a book three or four of the Austins, the non-time traveler series, but then they show up again later in the Murray's and the time traveler series. And so it's very interesting to see how it goes back and forth. And once I realized that when I was in high school, I'm like, Ooh, I'm going to go back and read this because I am a completionist. And if I start something and really enjoy it, I'm going to go read everything. The answer is to have Charles Wallace Tesseract and solve everything. Oh, For those of you who follow Swift my work and planet, even better. For those of you who know my work and know my little Easter eggs, You'll see that there's a Thomas Reed in the chat. I'll what does it say, say Thomas Reed? Shouldn't it say Toe Tag Reed? <laughs> I know he's alive in the chat. What the heck? We're not supposed to see him alive. Come on. He's speaking. <laughs> Good to see you, Reed. Good to see you. <laughs> but I mean, so but if you wind up doing, you know, if, if you wind up writing stuff that crosses over and you have those little, you know, nudge, nudge, wink, wink moments. How do you do it? So it's not like, okay, so with treat, it's a, it, this is a great thing because 
it's very nudge, nudge, wink, wink. It's not always super obvious, but if you read Paul's stuff, you're going to see it all the time. Um, Patrick the Assassin with Terry. If you know the beginnings of that inclusion and how that came to be, it's fucking hysterical. And then to see that pop up again and again, it's really funny. But Thomas Reed has been a corpse in my book since I started. Yeah, but if you and but, but the thing is, if you don't get it, it doesn't distract from the story. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. I think that's like that's the best way to put it in. And then when you have your fans like, oh, oh, now I get it. So I mean, I remember it, it's. I haven't written enough to do it with like co-authoring stuff. But there's certain things that I've written for Secret World Chronicle where, you know, I was calling out former students I had that I really liked and they got to live. And then moments where I had, you know, former co-workers and supervisors that may or may not have perished in rock slides during a very, very large battle. But those things are so esoteric, you may not find them. Yes, Thomas Reed started as a file of a dead corpse in Tattoo, and he raged about it on Twitter. And so I decided after that he would always be a corpse in my books. So if it, so he's in the Black Outbreak, he's in the Black, he's in Arrival, he's in, um, uh, he's in the Derelict Saga, he's in Garagas, or he's in the Garagas stories, the modern ones. He's in the uh, Gare's Inferno, where he's a particularly crispy corpse. Um, there, there's just, I put him all over the place because that's that, that private joke. And it, it, it basically, I'm dropping it there. The people who remember from the very beginning, I just always chuckle about what it is I've done to Thomas Reed in this book. And if I could do it in every book in every universe that I write, I would, and I try and get away with it, but there's some times where I can't, but it's, uh, it's just one of those Easter eggs that we leave lying around and. I know the people who who know the tale all roll their eyes when they go, all right, where's Treed showing up? All right, there he is. I see that person. We got we're walking to a mortuary or whatever. We know Treed is gonna be in there. I saw a post on Facebook that I've seen before, but I saw it again a couple of days ago. That a woman says that my husband is an author, and all of his stories he has a character named whatever the character's name was, that um, is killed during the story. And the reason being is because before the husband and wife met, she dated this other guy. And it's not that he hated the other guy, but the other guy is a successful architect and he designs buildings. The husband can't design buildings, so he just designs stories and throws the other guy out of them. <laughs> I can appreciate that. <laughs> Martha says, that's what I've been doing. Easter egg references for ones that can't because of time or space interact with others that are currently written, but some will be able to intersect with other characters. Yeah, absolutely. Refer to, I refer to events all over the place in Derelict Saga that I may or may not write, but they're shared touchstones for the characters. And so you get little details every now and then. It basically just solidifies the backstories and, and gives me an in if I decide I want to write those stories. Are you killed twice in the black? What do you mean in the black series? I don't think I killed you twice in the black. It's a common twice. last name you could have. <laughs> There's no telling. There's no telling. There's absolutely no telling. <laughs> I'm going over to live. I found the image and I will paste it there. Colin suffers a horrible death. The series, oh, yeah. Yeah, that one. That I have seen. Yeah, I get you in the black. I get you in Outbreak. I can't remember if I got you in Arrival some way. I don't remember. Speaking of Patrick the Assassin, he shows up again in this book. He's been missing for like three or four books because he's been off doing assassiny things. So he's going he's gonna to just, how should we say it? Sashay into this book and then sashay right back out again. <laughs> Why didn't that guy get his own crossover series? He could have one. I he absolutely could have one. Something you should talk to Cheney about a limited run, like three Patrick the Assassin books. 
Nice ah, the trilogy. glories of just killing the people that need killing. Well, I think that would be fun if you've got all that, because then you could have him intersecting in the evil plans that he's got for the other characters that are in those other books or what he thinks about them or whatever else. You have a lot of material there, Bubba. I mean, you you could go so far as to, like, the events of certain books. You could go and write some of those events from, from Patrick the Assassin's point of view. And then yeah. what's he doing behind the scenes at that time? So maybe yeah. he's pulling strings and doing other stuff to make stuff happen. Are you familiar with Rat Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, Terry? I am. It's okay, a great movie. So those, so those two chuckleheads are taken from, from Hamlet. There are two very minor characters that pop up at important points, but ultimately they really don't mean a hill of beans as far as the uh, the play goes in any way, shape, fashion, or form. Tom Stoppard loved them and turned them into an absurdist couple. And it's just absolutely amazing. But the thing ah, is, it's just... The scientific breakthroughs they almost made. <laughs> It is, it is really damn funny. The point is that basically they took those two characters from that story, and Shakespeare could have done it, just basically made a play just about those two rubes and whatever crazy things they were up to and have it intersect back with Hamlet, and it would have been perfectly fine. I, I, I cannot forget the uh, bathtub scene where they've got the little floating boat in there, and the one puts himself in the water and watches it rise and then stands up and then sits back down. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's does he a, it's does a, he yell Eureka when he finally sits? I I've he, only seen bits and pieces. He they never actually never make a discovery. They just oh. come very close to making a discovery and see it and then move on. Just like when they when they're flipping the coin and it's always landing on heads or tails. I don't remember which one it is, and they're talking heads, about the I probabilities. Think. Yeah, it's just it's just damn funny. Just damn funny. Anyway. Point is, is that you have opportunities as a writer to go back and look at those things and go, you know what? I can actually take this stupid character and do something really cool with them. Hey, Doc. Good to see you. So I, I think that's something you need to consider is basically, do I have some stories I could tell about Patrick the Assassin? Because if the series was, was uh, so the main series was successful enough, I would think people would love to go back into that well, world. If, if I was going to do that, I already knew what the series name would be. Killing time. Yes. Yeah, I don't need to help you brainstorm any more books. Fuck you. Anyway, <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. You're such a douchebag. Anyway, well, the uh, the the. Uh, it's always um, good coming up with a name that can be taken multiple ways, and it yes. fits the character so well. Yes, I agree. I agree. You're still a douchebag, but. <laughs> I mean, those openings are glorious because I mean, I've got the the openings with Doctor G for the Derelict Saga. I just haven't done anything with them, and I've got other ends with uh, the Satellite War. I've got the uh, Mars Insurrection, and I've got the story of Red and Blue, the stories of Red and Blue, which I can basically all put together. And there's there's stuff that happens before the Derelict Saga with that crew that I can put in there as well. I just have, have to have it be interesting so I can sell it or find a way to sell it. I mean, we wound up with Secret World Chronicle. We finished the series, but we still had stories. And so a couple of years later, we just put out another anthology of short stories that either talked about character backstories or um, we had, because the premise is that all of the metahumans came from World War II. So we had some World War II stories in there. Um, and we had kind of some some what ifs of how other characters could have come into play. And for people who are super fans, it works. And then you get ideas of, oh, I could keep doing this or I could keep doing that. And then sometimes your ideas come because there's a cat grooming the back of your head. Thank you, Leo. I'm stopping. He doesn't look good. I'm going to make this the perfect hairstyle. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, it's feline coiffeur. I must do it. So we covered Easter eggs here. We covered the genre switching. Shared and universe. Any... Or... Go ahead. 
I was going to say, so you talked about genre switching. Are there genres, are there rules for genre switching? Like, are there some genre, like, okay, so if you're going to switch genres, does that mean that you need a new pen name? Do you want a new pen name? Do you need, how familiar do you need to be with the genre? Ooh, we're really going to get into that, open that can of worms. We got a half hour I, left. I mean, I don't, I'll, per, I don't I'll personally think. I don't personally think you need a pen name. I think with the bigs, you needed a pen name because you were switching presses half the time if you switch genres. And I think that's one of the reasons why it was done that way. And let's face it, if if I start writing spicy romance, I may not want the people who find my other books to find me as a spicy romance writer. Spicy possum shifter romances. I'm going to shut up before I see something just X-rated. Anyway, the, uh... Oh, oh, you're so sexy when you play dead. <laughs> I always wonder what it'd be like fucking a corpse. Oh! <laughs> What'd you do today, honey? Well, I fucked some roadkill. <laughs> What did you get to down the swamp? Uh, well. Oh, shit. <laughs> <sighs> or you don't want your spicy romance readers to be appalled at your horror novels. That's a good point. Also true. Yeah. Also true. God, also yeah. true. Yeah, this is why I'm writing an open-ended episodic series. I can always add a new story. Yep, Doc. That's one of the reasons to do them. <laughs> it's what says the flying spaghetti monster was in me last night. <laughs> No one is talking about writing monster erotic romance, but... Behold his newly appendages and beware of where they might go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I broke the... <laughs> I'm just... I'm... She's just going, I narrated that story. <laughs> The fact you're not saying you haven't tells me everything I need to know. No comment, huh? <laughs> Antoine, Everyone you're have has to their save... talents and niches in narration. <laughs> Mine happen to involve tentacles, and I can command a good rate for it, okay? I didn't know you had that many orifices, but that's just me. I'm not sure you really need that many orifices. Depends on how many tentacles you're going to service. Well, there's more than one tentacle that can go in an orifice. Yeah, are, you're not clearly not up on your trends in your monster erotic romance, sir. I, I, mean, I guess I missed I missed the uh, stretching portion of this particular thing. Clearly, uh, Thomas Reed says, "Didn't know Bell's write a sexy sex monster story?" Yes, I'm confident he did. Three I'm confident Veronica narrated them. <laughs> I did. I did, and they are fantastic. Not just because for that they that it's erotic, but it is fantastic science fiction, and it's it, it excellent, excellent science fiction conventions. Um, but yeah, Monster Whisperer. The first and second one are on in audiobook. The third one, I think, you can only get by joining his Patreon. Um, Spots. It's fun. I like narrating it. Martha says, or if you write a fantasy romantic erotica and a Winnie the Pooh meets the monsters in the dark with your child, me thinks this one should be written under a pen name, abbreviation, or a primary one. Yeah. Yeah. There, and that's another thing. Depending upon, like nowadays, I, I don't have a problem with people knowing my pseudonym or knowing, you know, what I narrate, but when I worked at the university, I try I was a little more subdued about it because image. And then if I was working in high school or mm. middle school, I would definitely and definitely I mean there have been lawsuits of authors who taught in elementary school and they're writing romance and they've used even though they've used pseudonyms. And they've been doxxed as the best, you know, thing I come up with. They've, they've been outed 
as these spicy authors and they wind up losing their teaching jobs because evidently if you write spicy romance, you shouldn't be teaching children. Mm. Which is bullshit. But. Monster uh, romance black. Sizzle, sizzling genitals. Hashtag sizzling genitals. <laughs> the sleeping monster is recharged and is now buzzing. Oh dear. Uh-huh. Your, your, your hands are full. Arms are full. You might not be able to move. I think if you get another cat. Okay. Professor D read some kinky shit. To be fair. Teach me. I distinctly remember. I distinctly remember um, when I was still teaching at the university. And keep in mind, I taught like 18 to 21 year olds. And there was always that that kind of snarky one-upmanship. And they constantly tried to do it to me because I was young enough that I would get most of the references, but I was still old enough that they thought that they could shock me. So I told them about the street. (laughs) And I linked them to it. And one of the lo- one of my lovely students I was explaining and someone else finally listened to it and they came back the next day and they go, wow, you're messed up. And I gleefully smiled at them over my coffee and I said, oh, you haven't even gotten the fraggles yet. And this sweet little girl goes, oh my God, what did you do to the fraggles? And I thought my work is done here. And I went back to my office and yeah, so it's, it, I was, I was in a position where I could politely corrupt and in an environment where I could chat about that, but not everybody who works in education or it, it's, it's weird. It is weird. And you have to know what to keep to yourself and what you can promote. And sometimes it means if you're, if you've got your day job and you're writing, you almost have to create a different persona. Um, and if you're writing in certain genres, I mean, I know when we were at 20 books, I was talking to authors and they have different personas for each series that they write because the genres are just different enough and they don't want crossover between their fans, which I get. It, it's, it's a marketing and tactical thing. Back when I worked at NASA and was writing erotica, I didn't let that information get around. Yeah. Yeah, you did it the right way. Worth it says, this is why my, why my pen name is completely divorced from my private life. I filed a DBA and everything. No one knows or will know my even my physical appearance, gender, ethnicity, etc. Good deal. Mm-hmm. Open full fin that children learn about safe sexual conduct instead of just having sex on their own and making how it's a horrible mistakes. Well, Thank you know, you I think it. I think that's where you're making a misunderstanding, Doc. If you're talking about something that Paul wrote, he is definitely not writing about safe sex. <laughs> Thomas mm. said when I taught high school, I kept my list and pleasures to myself. Now at college, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's a little more leeway. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know for a fact that my daughter has her her group of friends and they read now granted most of them read trad pub spicy romance but they still read spicy romance and they will go to school and they've got their little their you know they've got their paperbacks and they will trade amongst each other and they will talk about what happens but i if she can read it go for it because the vast majority of authors these days who are writing spicy romance, at least what I know, she doesn't read urban fantasy. She's strictly a contemporary rom-com kind of person. And I know that the trends right now in that genre are, they involve consent. It's very sex positive. It's a very balanced viewpoint. Read it. Knock yourself out. So, I... And if and there's stuff she's like, oh, I want to read that. I'm narrating it. I'll read it. I'm not listening to it. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so there's also that podcast that, that I, I 
guess it was a couple of kids did, kids, young people, I say, mm -hmm. that uh, when one of them found out that his father, or I think it was his father, wrote erotica, my dad wrote a porno. And they do dramatic readings of, of his writings. <laughs> uh, I, I would be concerned if, as my kids get older, if they find what I've narrated or read stuff that I've written. But at the end of the day, if they're going to take me to the house, I'm like, look, that paid for your tuition. That paid for all those bowling tournaments. You better be thankful I know how to say all those words properly and with the right inflection. I, I, you know, my father listens and reads everything I write. So there's always that thought in my mind before I press publish or before I put on Patreon. I'm sitting there going, what is dad going to think about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's a quite frankly, it's a little different from what. what, what There's only dismembering. There's what not my dad sex. About this. His favorite series, Garaga. He wants more sucky by. Well, who <laughs> wouldn't? I mean, maybe you need to have some more incubi. Well, that too. There's gonna be more incubi. Trust me. If you want, if you want a really, really good. Um, Really good Incubi character, uh, Metamor City. Uh, mm. John? John. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Excellent. So, Gragas children are complicated. Was I the only one who was taught that it is a breach of ethics to use your day job to promote your side hustle? Why does everyone assume that if you have a side hustle, you'd be promoting it at work? Very good point. I'm mm. not sure that everybody thinks that. I th it may depend on where you work. Yeah. Um, I think I've only, I mean, granted, I've only I had a government contractor job for literally a year. And it was so bizarre in where, when, what I was doing and where it was um, that I, I can't make, I can't draw any conclusions. But in, higher ed you want to seem as much of a real person at least with what I was doing because I had a lot of student facing stuff and I wound up having students coming to me saying well you you were doing this academic thing and now you're writing how did you do that and so sometimes letting people know it's not a terrible thing Promoting stuff like, hey, come buy my book. Depending upon where you work and in what realm, that's not a terrible thing. Unless you're a professor and you say, here, I've written this 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 manual for my own course, and now everyone must go buy it for this hideous price. <laughs> what are you talking about? That, that's perfectly normal. That's <laughs> I know. standard normal operating and procedure. And it happens, and it's bullshit. Treat says, I promote all my podcast authors. They are the ones I'm most loyal to. Oh. Aww. 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 <laughs> oh, think about if, if you got a friend at work who's in a band, they might say, yeah, he should come by and check us out or we're, we're playing live next week or whatever. I'd love to see you there. Right. That's, that's not promoting the band and necessarily it's not a hard sell. Um, mm -hmm. you know, telling people about my podcast, that wasn't a problem. I wasn't like, you should listen to my podcast right now. It's, it's just like, yeah, I do a podcast. You know, if you ever want to check it out, here it is. You know, mm -hmm. that's it. It's stuff like that. It, that's what I would do at my day job. And if somebody asked me about my books, I'd tell them about it, but I wouldn't get in everybody's face and say, buy my book. Right. That's annoying. Yeah. It's, and it's not like you've got a display out at your desk where you've got all of the books like posted there. QR codes to take them straight to where they need to go. Well, at Broadsoft, that's, what's, a lot of that's had... what's on your shirt, the QR code you wear to work. At Broadsoft, a lot of people had a copy of the street on their desk. I'm just saying that right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's not promotion. That's mental health management. Yeah, that was mental health management. <laughs> I have pictures of my book covers at my desk at work. They're my children. I will answer questions, but I don't bring it up. Yeah. Nothing yeah. wrong with that at all. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if Treat says, hey, you wouldn't say that if you heard what I say. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I see how that is. 
the size of the covers are pretty. Yeah, I've seen your covers. Yeah, they they're are. Good. They are really Doc's covers. If you like steampunk, those covers are pretty. And gaslight. Tiny. Hmm. Don't forget yes. gaslight. Writes gaslight that, as well. Is that a genre? I don't know it that is. I'd heard of gaslight as a genre. Maybe it's gas lamp. It's basically steampunk without the steam portion of things, if I understand it correctly. It's I'm almost lighter. sure that it's not going to end up being gaslight because you wouldn't want to have your genre sound like you're gaslighting somebody. That sounds like that's a bad thing. I would think so, but uh, I thought that's what it was called. Doc can correct me. Gas okay. lamp. Thank you. Gas lamp. Gaslight, gas lamp. Ah! Whatever you want to call it. Anyway. Gas lamp fantasy. Okay. Different from steampunk. But kind of has, I'm guessing has that noirish older, older feel to it though. I have, I'm ignorant of the genre. So if I talk, if I step on something, don't be surprised. Just don't, you know, take me to task for it. That's what we do in the after show. <laughs> mm, after show. Love where we will, show. where we will spend the hour brainstorming Paul's next book. Let's not. Let's not. It's more fantasy, less science. Got it. Okay. So I remember I saw you at a panel at Balticon, and it was gas lamp, or you guys were talking about gas lamp, and I didn't quite get it, the context, because everybody knew what it was, and I didn't. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. Yes, brainstorm. I don't know. Doomed. You are doomed. Ghoulie doesn't mind fuck. Sigler's a gore fest and Rossi is just damn terrifying. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Sigler, Sigler is actually pretty gory. And Rossi does have a way of turning things around on you. Speaking yeah. of, if you haven't read Crescents, you should read Crescent by Phil Rossi. If you haven't read anything by Scott Sigler, you should read The Infected um, yeah, just, trilogy. Uh, yeah, just be careful um, I know I listened to it and there were a couple times where I, the problem is like when you're driving and listening to stuff and you're like, Oh, oh. all I could say oh, is save oh. Harry's balls. There it is. There it is. Literally you you will never look at a pair of chicken scissors the, the same, same way again. Way again. <laughs> <laughs> and Crescent was awesome. So you should definitely far future horror. It was really good. It was really good. This has a couple other books, too. I've been reading a lot of books on Royal Road recently. Just, you know, to read something different, read some lit RPG that's just people putting out their serials on there. And I tried to go and read a lit RPG that was a science fiction lit RPG. And it just didn't work for me. It just didn't grab me. It's because of the conceit or... It was all corporate, all money, all whatnot. It, the story just, it, the elements of the story didn't grab me the way something like um, the fantasy-based stuff does. I'm not sure. If somebody was describing Wayland yutani essentially? Pretty much, but every single company was like them. I can see that future. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can definitely see that future. <laughs> Given the world they put there, I could have written a story that was gripping and fun, I think, inside that world. But it it just felt like the story didn't have as much of a stole of a soul as I wanted in it. It felt more like kind of going through the motions, and I didn't particularly care for that. I got bored. Hmm. You that couldn't do anything to that connect. may that may just be me because tastes vary, and just because I didn't like it doesn't mean other people don't. Fair enough. Almost didn't get out of chapter one of Rossi's Harvey. Yeah, Harvey was the one I was thinking of. That's a good one, too. That's a really good one. I think that's kind of sad because it does it does offer a lot of opportunities. I've gotten to the point where in the last two Suits novels, I've just said the company. I haven't even given it a name. Because they just basically always speak of it as the company. And yeah, I, I want... I wind up like... I think the the, the sci-fi generation ship project that I have all of the it's an oligarchies so all of the companies are named after families because that was the easiest way to do it because I don't want to think of any more names 
Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, have that many. Trust me. If I was going to write a far future corrupt oligarchy type thing, I think it would be less like the alien universe and more like the Blade Runner universe. That would be more fun. Yeah. The thing is, in the Blade Runner universe, we really don't understand how those companies worked because we didn't get an inside view of it. But we knew that they were corrupt and they knew, we yes. knew that they were oligarchies that were putting their power down on everything else. So we knew that it existed. And that gives you but enough of a framework. Teams. Yeah, it gave you the framework and the backdrop, but it wasn't, it did not, it did not adversely intrude on the story. If that makes sense. Sure. Yeah. That may be why it worked better for you. The second right. movie didn't work that well for me. I wish that they had done the second movie better. But they God, didn't. I don't understand the hate for that movie. I like that movie. It's too slow. I like it's, that movie. Every scene takes at least 50% more time dragging the reader, the watcher through it than it should have. If the pace was a little faster, I think it would have been better. I like it just the way it is. Tastes very. Tastes very, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. So genre bunnies, Easter eggs, pen names. What else can we cover in two minutes? <laughs> we could always go back to tentacles. Tentacles and orifices. Is a ten you know, at some point, you're going to have to put together a poster. Of, you know, show me where the black touched you. Something on that line. Just have a big hole. Wouldn't paper. the burn marks and missing limbs, like, <laughs> let you know? Like, straight it's just off? a stump. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Terry, you look concerned. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> oh, man. I'm looking through chat here. You guys have been pretty chatty today. We like that. Yeah, thank you for joining us on a holiday weekend. We appreciate it. Now I'm afraid of what after dark holds. You should be. I you should be very afraid. Because the opening gambit is possums. Well, there is not going to be any possums. Fine. I mean, you don't you don't want to have to copy Charlie Brown, so we'll have to figure out another shifter animal for you. This is my possum right here. See. Ooh. I like him better with his guy fox mask. I mean, how do you get into After Dark? After Dark is for our patrons. So But there's buy me a coffee that you can chunk in a little bit coffee. of chunk in a little bit of change. Paul will at the end of the episode will read off the the how to do that and you can we'll chunk a little bit of change in there and get a link through the buy me a coffee thing. Yes, we make it very easy for you to get in there and enjoy the insanity. But it's we, really we, we can't sport. we can't promise a tentacle free environment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely can't uh, say there won't be mention of butt stuff either because Antoine's in the chat, but that's, you know, beside the yeah. point. He shall now be renamed the Golden Starfish. Starfish? <laughs> Instead of the Chocolate Starfish? <laughs> I, oh my lord. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be the, you know, or the <laughs> Snickers Launcher. You can also call it the Snickers Launcher. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> For, for his say, tricks, why? for his tricks in After Dark, he makes left Twix, <laughs> not the right ones. Left Twix. That's an imbalance issue. <laughs> I mean, why do you fix that? What kind of fiber do you have to take to make it a helix again? <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. Just, just for this, I will. I'm gonna figure out the most obnoxious, like, animal shifter that we can find. Oh, I have it. Oh no, Paul's doomed now. If you have a comment or question about this show and you want to save me from what's coming next, you can send an email to show at DebRobotSociety.com. You can find me on Mastodon at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley at BYRSE dot social. You can find us on Facebook of the Dev Robot Society writing community. 
You can find us at YouTube at youtube.com slash GRS podcast, where we are live every Saturday at 3 p.m. CST. Like and subscribe so you know when we're live. Of course, I say that. And next week, our co-hosts may not be here. I'll have to figure something out. And if you want to support the show, you can find us at patreon.com slash DRS podcast and buy me a coffee.com slash DRS podcast, where for as little as $1 a month, you get access to exclusive live shows like DRS After Dark, which we are doing in just a moment or two. And at the $10 level, you get your name read. And your, our $10 patrons are Nate Cosby, Antoine Batts, Tony L. Joy, Rick Shaw, Lisa Slack, Isabel Cushy, and Tim Niederreiter. Thank you to all of our patrons for making this show possible. And with that, it's did, time did for you us mention? To get out of here. Did you mention buy me a coffee? Because we were asked about that. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure. I didn't want to leave somebody hanging. Do you ever listen to what I say? No, I kind of I kind of tune out the outro. Uh, <laughs> drone. I need a new co. I need a new co-host. Me, me, me. We need a new co-host. <laughs> but then we won't have the cats. And, and... Well, yeah, this is true. That's a huge draw. Yeah. All right, folks. Enjoy your your holiday weekend. Thanks for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. Love you, chat. Thank you for for all of your comments. We love it. So, until then, have a great week. Be safe, and we'll talk again real soon. Bye. Bye.